groups. We have a few minutes for, for questions. Um, um, I just wanted to recognize the similarities uh, amongst their presentations um, and how this applies internationally. Um, and what I had mentioned even earlier in my presentation, how this applies, uh, this genocide and the attacks on Indigenous women internationally. Um, you know, Mother Earth is, is, a, is a huge place where we all live and the attacks on on our mother is the same attacks as on our women. So, um, so we'll um, start if anyone has, has any questions. There's a couple up here. Wolf. Thank you both uh, for your presentations. Uh, my question is for Nusta. Um, so, uh, I was uh, surprised about the time period of your presentation because in my recollection there was another wave of a large mass sterilization which ended somewhere in the 1970s, if I'm not mistaken. Can you make uh, some uh, reference to, is there a connection? Uh, uh, is this kind of a revitalization or is this a very different program? And then um, you briefly mention uh, there is something about poverty and modernization, but maybe you can uh, say two or three sentences about uh, what did they display as their motivation for this program? Yeah, thank you so much for those questions. Um, um, the 1970s um, sterilizations were, um, I, and what's very interesting was um, that never gets referenced, um, and it's a completely different type of uh, program that was emphasized. Um, so I think those are two different instances. What's unique about um, the victimhood that emerged during this time is because it was also occurring within the same time frame as the internal armed conflict. And so um, within the internal armed conflict, which I already mentioned before, there was already um, a strong targeting of indigenous peoples, which I, I, you know, to this day I, I have argued many times with the president of the Truth and Reconcil Reconciliation Commission, Salomon Lerner, um, as to why that was never characterized as genocide, but they also wanted to stay away from that term. So that's something that they also wanted to um, stay away, even though it was very clear that the characteristics of victimhood that also emerged from the internal armed conflict period were clearly more indigenous, weirdly more indigenous than others. Um, so that's something that I wanted to uh, mention. Let's see, what was your second question? It had to do with... Oh, yes, yes. Um, so when it comes to the representation of the victimhood that emerged from the family planning program, there were clearly women um, of indigenous descent who were predominantly um, you know, indigenous language speakers and who resided in rural areas or at times in urban poor neighborhoods. Um, so one of the victims who is non-indigenous um, who has been very, very vocal about her case, Victoria Vigo. She um, was from Piura, which is a city, but she was from the more um, you know, poor area of Piura, and in her case, she was coercively sterilized. Um, um, I think nine, nine months and a half is about how long it takes for you to actually give birth. She was nine months in, and then she went to her doctor because she was feeling a little dizzy, which you know, women, women feel like that in nine months. Yeah, seven months, so it depends, right? So she went to her doctor and then um, her doctor said, well, we don't have any beds here because she went to her regular doctor and I'll, you know, I'll send you to the bigger hospital. And so the ambulance came and picked her up and took her to the bigger hospital and then she was rushed into the ER and then um, they told her she had to get um, into surgery, emergency surgery, even though her doctor said, I think you just need one of those like IV fluids but they just you know, did the surgery on her against her will, took out the baby, was premature, and then she even heard the baby crying, and then the baby died um, right after, and then they had tied her tubes by the time she woke up. So there's people like her, but she is a minority. The majority of the people are still um, indigenous women. There have been some uh, tensions because she has been more vocal, and she has been more, um, she had started her own activism first. It might be because she had access to resources because she was in the city. Um, so there's been some tension among victim groups as well because you know some people think 
you are getting too much press. Our victimhood matters, but um, I think at the end, um, when I would talk to other more open and more people that have been involved in social movements for a while who are indigenous, they would say that we have to pull each other all together for our collective victimhood to be recognized and for us to all get collective forms of justice. Thanks, my question's for Dawn. Um, first of all, it's more maybe more of a reflection, but I wanna thank you for what you shared, but also f just for your analysis, because I know we get that through the body and suffering. It's not just an intellectual thing. And I just wanted to share that um, my mom is from Port Chipewyan, so all this tar sand stuff. Yeah. I've had cancer twice, I've had four yeah. hip surgeries. You know, all the ba girl babies in our family couldn't walk when they were little. So mm -hmm. I'm what you're talking about. And I guess I wanna know if you have any victories to share around that area, around fighting um, the pipelines, uh, pipelines or shutting down any of this gas and oil production, something that, uh, you know, to show our resistance and if we've made any gains in that way. I um, wish I could tell you yes. Um, I mean, Fort Chippewa is like at the epicenter mm -hmm. of this and the, and the, and the doctor there who did the study, you can like look it up, it's kind of hard to find though, because they hit it, um, is the one that started raising the alarm, similar to Flint, Michigan, and the, the poisoning there with the water. It was one doctor who was noticing this huge spike. Now, we do something in Canada called da data sovereignty. So when I wanted to look at Six Nations Health and see what, because we found things in the water, so you look for certain kinds of outcomes similar to Fort Chippewyan, not as bad. Um, but still, we don't have our own uh, data. So this is a big problem. So when I went to pull all the data to say, well, what is Six Nations House? How are women? How many are sterilized? Nothing, right? So all you have is in Indigenous Affairs, a little bit of a survey here, and then it's the province, and then it's over here. So when you pull the data, it makes no sense, and it's not, and I believe that's on purpose, because if we were able to truly track the health of Six Nations, so I can't find out anything about Six Nations people's health as I can about F Fort Chippewyan, because there's no uh, data sovereignty. It goes to different agencies. So one of the things in my project that the Six Nations Health Services director who's on the grant was very clear is they wanted a longitudinal study. They wanted baseline data so that we could begin to see whether there are certain patterns of diseases, like we think there's high levels of cancer. They think it's associated with the tap water. So we, we can't prove anything, right? So, so the government in my view, purposely keeps data very uh, dispersed, which is really fascinating, um, considering how data-driven science is supposed to be. Um, when it comes to health, that it's not. So no, I don't, because we can't, and that's to me one of the frustrations. We really need to start developing our own data. So I have people building a platform for our community, and then the question becomes, who holds the data, you know? <laughs> so uh, right now, I'm just working with the high schools, and I'm, I'm embedding our mapping and all of our work in the high schools, because it to me, it's we need capacity building. So that's, I think, some there are some good things happening, but they're not necessarily coming from the government and I am very worried about what's happening to the water because we did it we did test the water in Al in, in Lubicon and, and it was not it like some of it isn't even water anymore like it just can't even be classified and this is a place that had a, a great deal of water so I'm very concerned about their water security and then the boreal forest is likely going to be like California where you're going to have a lot of forest fires and none of the people that live in that northern area that still hunt are prepared for this kind of disaster. So climate change is really, I think, what the north is probably focused on. So, but uh, st like sterilization is definitely happening up there as well. I just want to let you know I go up there and they are, I don't know what the name is. It's, it's the, Karen Stout talks about it in her book. It's, the, it's where you stop getting your menses. They put this 
thing on your arm. Does anybody know the word for that? There you go. Okay, all the girls had it, and I'm like, what is this, you know? And they said, oh, this is the only way they'll let us have birth control. And they all looked really unwell. They, they, they look really bloated, and they're pretty fit hunting people that are out on the land. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, you guys eating, getting access to french fries or something? Because, like, they all were doubled in size. And, and so that is another tactic that we don't automatically understand. That is a form of sterilization. It's a coercing a certain type of very damaging birth control, which again, going back to Kaufman, um, was their plan, was to stop the birth. And, and women aren't even asking for it. They're just going in for a, a cold, or, you know, and then they're getting this inserted in them. So again, you know, the tubal ligation, all those things are happening in the north. And like she said, I, I know it's happening. I've been up there for 30 years interviewing and working with women. They do not want it. it just, it's too spiritual. It's too profound. And it's not my job to victimize them further by saying, well, I need your story to prove that this is happening. It's, it's really devastating though, because I can, I'm witnessing it happen. Um, and, and oil, I mean, look what they're doing in the Middle East and, and anywhere else for oil. You can imagine what they're doing in, in the tar sands. And that includes your community. Yeah, and I just think it's brilliant. The mapping that you and your grad student did about the pipelines and the missing and murdered women. And uh, my colleague Barb from Whitehorse was supposed to come and talk about man camps in the Yukon, and she couldn't come. But um, she's on it. Like, it, I can't wait to see that map as well. It'll Maybe be open share. source. So once we release the, the the mapping of Haudenosaunee territory, the idea is like I also have the terror stories in um, South Dakota with my buddies there, and they've picked it up. The Dakotas from from uh, Sisseton are, are carrying out the mapping in their college in the language. And my hope is that we, once we make it open source, everybody can use this um, app, if you will, this archive, and you can make it private. So you can make you know stories that people don't want shared with the public, but at least you're collecting them. And then there's things you can make public. So my goal, and to me, that is part of asserting our sovereignty, is getting our language, I don't have anything in English on there. It's all in our languages. I have archaeological sites as well as water quality, right, to I'd like to be able to map health so we could see the hot spots of health, which would easily tell us. And you're going to need to know whether your water has contaminants in it in the future. Everybody's going to need to have an app that's able to say, is this water OK for my child to swim in? So we're trying to make those tools with our project. Um, we're halfway there. COVID kind of knocked us down a bit, but then we did some other cool stuff. So, so hopefully it'll be accessible to all Indigenous people, not just um, Haudenosaunee. Yeah. Just a brief, brief question with uh, new stuff, I may. Um, a, a question about the politics. You've been talking about the legal implications of uh, of doing this work with victims, which is wonderful work. Um, but of course, Fujimori's daughter is one of the best known political <laughs> figures in Peru. And we've been kind of circling discussions of denialism in a bunch of different cases today. So I wondered if you'd talk a little bit to us about that yeah, current absolutely. situation. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so the person that um, you know, you're know you referring to is Keiko Fujimori, who is the daughter of, of Alberto Fujimori, who uh, I, mean, I can go on and on about him. but. He's come out of jail multiple times, presidential pardon. There was a lot of issues, and he went back, and then now he's, he's like the, he's trying to come out again, like going back and forth. Anyway, um, his his family has done a lot of. They've really tarnished the political landscape, um, and Kiko Fujimori is one of the most powerful politicians still in Peru, and she has run for presidential office. Um, unfortunately, she has failed. Um, and I hope she continues to fail. Um, but it comes up over and over again during the presidential election period. This is one of those topics that um, activist groups get on the street, and this is what they bring up on purpose to see her reaction. Um, and then she, she said, oh, I don't know, because she was the first lady. Um, there's you know, major politics related to her family. Like, 
she kicked her mom out. Her mom was, you know, like you know, mentally tortured by her dad. And then she was in place as a first lady, so she knew what was happening. So there's a lot of, you know, if we want to go into medial, I mean, legal jargon, mediated authorship, right? Also from her part of having um, been aware of what was happening. Um, so Keiko, definitely. Um, this is something that keeps biting her back. And this is something that keeps dragging her. Um, not her brother so much, but her definitely. Thank you. And just a brief other, or are we out of time? I don't want to no. go on and on. A brief other comment connecting it to, we were talking about Sepor Zarco very briefly during the break, which is a case, a well-known case in Guatemala of women who were sexually enslaved during the armed conflict there uh, in the 1980s. And just to criticize truth commissions again, to add to what you were saying about Peru, when the women were asked at their human rights trial uh, very recently, why weren't these stories told when the truth commissions were being gathered in the 19, not late 1990s, early 2000s. And they said simply, well, the Truth Commission came. They asked about the men who had been murdered. They wanted to know who died. Mm -hmm. But they didn't ask about sexual crimes. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, um, the women, when they were giving testimony about what had happened to them, really wanted to emphasize not, and, and I so appreciated your discussion of what kind of reparations women wanted or were asking for, because it's not just the reparations, it's the crimes. So when the Seporzarco women were giving testimony, they were talking about the crimes being committed against them as sexual, but also very importantly, being forced to make tortillas for occupiers on their land or members of the army, all of the kind of social reproductive tasks that women, um, do alongside pregnancy and everything that we were just talking about as part of this presentation. So I, I just wanted to underline that not just the reparations, but also the crimes. What What is the indigenous view from a particular community of what crimes have been committed against them? It's very important to listen to uh, as well. If I may follow up on that point, at least the good thing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when it came to sexual violence related to the internal armed conflict is that they had very strong feminists within the Truth and Reconciliation Commission board, like Sophie, Sophia Masher in, in particular. She really brought up, um, there was an entire section dedicated to sexual violence, but it doesn't mean because there is a chapter dedicated to sexual violence that you're going to be able to gather a lot of the information. One of the major criticisms that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission got was the fact that a lot of the people did not speak and they all looked white. Um, you know, they could have been mestizo, but they clearly, for the, from the indigenous perspective, they looked like they, they were coming from Lima. So what do you know of our plight? You guys were doing fine. So there was a lot of that um, you know, back and forth that went on. Uh, but so I mean, there's been other NGOs that have followed up uh, to work on sexual violence victims during the internal armed conflict. But at least to a certain extent, they got some you know, spotlight when it comes to course of sterilization victims. I mean, they're not even, even included in memory sites or sites of memory um, that NGOs have actually come up with. Um, so th there's been lots of questions about that. Okay, one last question. Thank you, each of you. I'm an old friend to Beverly. I met Beverly about 20 something years ago. Um, I'm Rosalie Gonzalez, I'm Chicana Kikapu, and I'm also the co-coordinator, elected co-coordinator for the Continental Network of Indigenous Women of the Americas. We're in North Mexico, Central and South America. And that's where I met Beverly. We were co-founders not only of ECMIA, but uh, the continental networks of organized indigenous women feed into uh, international form of indigenous women. And it was in 2000 that we launched overlapping with the CSW in New York City. And that being said, there's been a lot of organizing across the continent and around the world by indigenous women. And I wonder, I'm hearing the analysis and I feel there's a gap in analyzing what resistance is occurring on the ground, including in the Peru analysis. You make a critique of the you know, non-indigenous NGOs, which is a fair criticism that a lot of the non-indigenous feminists rise for us. But my question is, what is happening on the ground among indigenous leadership? There's a lot happening. So I think that's, uh, thank you for that question. There's a lot happening. So one of the main indigenous um, organizations is called Onamiap um, in Peru, and they've been doing a lot of activism. In fact, one of the public testimonies, first public testimony forums that took place was with the organization of Onamiap, 
with um, the UN Special Rapporteur at that time of Indigenous um, Related Matters, and then the Canadian Embassy, <laughs> which you know I always smile because I'm like, okay, Canadians are always involved in these things, at least overseas. <laughs> at least overseas, they're in, uh, involved in funding something. Uh, yes, I, I know. Um, so um, they've been very much active. Um, DEMOS is the main organization that's involved in providing legal counsel to victims. So ONAMIAP has also been working tirelessly with um, DEMOS and the DEMOS organizer or the main person that has been involved is uh, um, uh, Maria Isabel Sedano who works also directly um, with victims and indigenous um, NGOs and um, activists as well. The only um, issue that I, 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 not issue, but I just wondered, right, because I, I talk a lot with uh, Maria Isabel and I kept asking her, okay, so the justice, and she kept referring to like legal justice, we need legal justice. And I said, okay, 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 Maria. Like, but let me, let me ask, let me see if I, I, can, I can ask. And so then when I started talking, not with those that are involved with Onamiap, but other victims that are not necessarily, you know, the front faces of these big organizations. What is it that you want? How? What is it that you conceive? Then I started um, understanding that there was a, you know, a, a divergence or maybe a more longer list than what we normally think of, you know, criminal accountability alone. And that's when I was like, this needs to be unpacked. And one thing that I want to uh, mention is that um, this is actually um, the voice of the victims and things like that, um, and those who are victimized as part of a um, book manuscript that, that, that you know, is coming out next year. Um, where, but I specify my positionality and how I am simply channeling and providing only a place as a text writer of their voices and not trying to impose my ideas and this is the form of justice you need to be seeking. This is how, I, no, I, I'm, I'm trying to organically uh, do this so that um, I just become the, the person that's just telling the story. Um, and, and in that, I think maybe it might have to do with my own um, positionality as, as at least com you know, sharing something with um, you know, the indigenous communities of Peru. Thank you. I can answer that too. Um, so I, the whole first section was, I, I get nervous when our nationhood as sovereign Haudenosaunee gets reduced to resistance or activism. That's very dangerous to move in this direction because we have a constitution that predates the American. We, we are the law of this land in our territory. And if we start organizing ourselves as um, resistors, we are immediately p positioning ourselves in a subordinate and very unorganized, which is supposed to be, not that we don't do resistance, if you know our people, you know we are frontline every time, especially the Mohawks, um, Bev, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, but I get nervous about that because we really need to stick to facts. And the fact is, my people have never surrendered their sovereignty or subjugated themselves to American or Canadian law. So when we do something, we do it as a nation, and we do it with the rights of our constitution that we stand within our clan mother's direction. And that's a very different reality than the, like it's kind of fun <laughs> sometimes um, to go to the front lines and, and kind of vent. <laughs> Especially when they're throwing cheese at us. I'll never forget that one. Um, but I called it, yeah, bread and cheese day. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and you could tell CBC, the national news, is like, why are they throwing cheese at the Indians? <laughs> Anyways, like, we have a history that nobody's going to understand, it, it, that only we understand. So I get nervous if we get lopped into then, you know, resistance movements, because that is reactionary. And what I'm saying is we need to move out of that space into what, what the Pachamama, the law of the Americas, rests within the indigenous women of the Americas. And until that is recognized, we will always be at a disadvantage. And it'll, some president is nice, this one's bad, and we'll always be at the whim. And until we organize ourselves back as nations, 
and assert our sovereignty, we will continue to probably not gain the kind of momentum we need to in this climate crisis we are in. We have very little time. I don't know how to stress this as a climate change scientist. We have very little time to make some difference here. I mean, you should know this in California, you have no water. Arizona, you, this is gonna become a very a, a, huma, a, a crime against humanity. So we really need to organize ourselves in new ways, I think, to rise to that occasion as well. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, that's kinda, we're more than resistors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I just wanted to thank you for your attention. Thank you to our presenter, powerful presenters, and uh, and your questions. And uh, thank you again, Yawa. Yeah, well.